This is Ham Radio Now, episode 137, part one. The uh, K9W Wake Atoll 2013 Commemorative De-Expedition. That's what's going to be in, in part one. This is a uh, talk that was given at the Charlotte Ham Fest last weekend. Um, our tour guide is Lou Dietrich, N2TU. And um, this is not a video from the, uh, from the de-expedition. It is a slideshow. And Lou is going to show where they went and how they got there and, uh, and what they did. But it's, a lot of it is a, an actually sort of a travelogue as opposed to a you know, ham video thing. Um, he will show the, the radio stuff, but it's, it's perhaps not the most important part. But I think you'll be fascinated in what it takes to get a major de-expedition off the ground and to a place like the, uh, the Wake Atoll. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, first, of course, I need to have Arvin step in. And uh, well, Arvin doesn't move very much. It's just kind of sitting back there. But he does want me to remind you that Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you. So if you enjoy the programs, get something out of them. You know, these these de-expeditions, they are big money operations. I didn't get a figure for the wake uh, operation, but the next one that presented in part two, which is the Amsterdam Island, um, that was almost a half a million dollars. <laughs> That is big money. Chump change compared to what we're looking for from hams through uh, Arvin back there uh, for Ham Radio Now. So stop by hamradionow.tv, click on Arvin's picture if you like the program, and can chip in a little bit. Please do. So now let us head down to the Charlotte Ham Fest from last weekend, and uh, Lou Dietrich, N2TU, will narrate our tour of the Wake Island, Wake Atoll 2013 commemorative the expedition. Hello, hello. I don't. I don't usually use microphones like Joe Blackwell. We uh, like to use Morse code keys, but that's another story. Um, Wake 2013 commemorative de expedition. We'll get into why it was a commemorative de expedition as we go through the slides. I've got quite a few slides, and there's also a cue card in the back that tells me when I have 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and then 15. And so, the and then the hook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Hal's got the hook. So let's see if we can get through um, the, the entire presentation. Um, basically, where is, um, where is good old Wake Island on this map? If you look around, um, there it is, right there. It's quite a distance off into the Pacific, closer to Japan, obviously. It's, uh, we had to fly, Dick, myself, and Joe, we had to fly out to uh, Hawaii. We all met in Hawaii. We went from Hawaii to Wake uh, via um, Air Force transport, and that's uh, 2,300 miles out. And then uh, what was so uh, significant is Japan was right over our shoulder. So we could hear Japan just about 24 hours a day. And it's only 1,500 miles north of the Marianas. So we're, we're quite a ways out there. Uh, what is Wake Atoll? Wake Atoll is made up of three different islands. You got Peel Island up here. It looks like, to me, it looks like a seal, so it's easy to remember. That's Peel. And then you got Wilkes Island. Both of these are, are basically bird sanctuaries. And this is the uh, Wake Island itself. It's uh, first founded by Samuel, first discovered by Samuel Wake. And all, you can read through the rest of that stuff. It's just uh, a bunch of what uh, is significant about it. One thing that was really cool is a 9,800 foot runway along here that the Air Force uses. And I would love to have my Corvette out there. I mean, it's just a flat, beautiful, Beautiful run. Uh, it's just north of the equator. The uh, temperature was very, um, um, you know, top, uh, tropical, 80 to 85. We had a couple of really good uh, uh, rainstorms that came through. And right now, it's a US Air Force highly restricted base. Right over here on this tip of the island, there's a, uh, it's controlled by the Army. And uh, right now, they have um, silos over there, and they, uh, they shoot missiles off of here. It's part of the missile. Missile Defense Agency. But access to the island is extremely high restrict, highly restricted. A little bit about Wake Atoll and why we went. Um, it was first settled in uh, 1935. Pan Am built a uh, Pan Amville. Uh, it was a hotel. It was a, um, it was a stopover point, but it was a very uh, exclusive hotel. A lot of people would show up and, um, and uh, vacation there. It's just a beautiful island, or it, it was and it still could be. Uh, 1941, U.S. Navy uh, begins construction of the military base there. 
Reason for that is they felt World War II was going to start. So they started to uh, fortify the island. Uh, first garrison arrived, the Marines, Navy, and uh, quite a few civilians. Uh, Japanese, December 7th, attacked Pearl Harbor. The same day they attacked World, I'm sorry, Wake Island. Uh, it's on the other side of the time zone, so uh, they simultaneous attack. Uh, during the uh, fierce battle, the garrison held their position. They sank two Japanese destroyers, a sub, um, severely damaged other ships. Uh, there were about a thousand Japanese people died, Japanese um, soldiers. On December 23rd, the Japanese finally took over uh, Wake and took control. And all U.S. Um, military and civilians, uh, well, they were, they were sent to POW camps around Asia, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia. The only thing that was left on the island were 98 civilian contractors, and they became known as the Forgotten 98. And for two years, the uh, Forgotten 98 POWs, uh, they built bunkers, and we'll get into a little bit of that later on, and ditches, and basically they fortified the island for the J Japanese as POWs. Japanese didn't believe in the Geneva Convention, so they just used whoever, they, uh, whoever were POWs for any kind of work they could. Uh, civilians were not supposed to be used in these, uh, um, in these endeavors, but they used them anyway. On October 7, 1943, um, they, they thought because the um, um, Yorktown was coming by, they, they had a fierce air raid on, um, on October the 5th. Yorktown was just coming by, going someplace else, but they attacked um, Wake on the way by just for good measure, I guess. And the Japanese thought at that time that, that the U.S. was going to retake the island. So what they did was, uh, they, um, like, like I say, they had no intention of a forced landing. But what happened was they took the remaining 98 people out back and took them to an, um, the, one of the shores and they, they executed them. Um, and again, there was no intention of a forced landing on Wake. And for the next two years, basically, Wake was isolated. No food or anything else got there. Japanese got uh, pretty, uh, pretty starved out, which uh, I don't know if it was fitting or not. But um, again, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, some, it, and Wake served as a refueling stop, uh, Korean War, Vietnam, Desert Storm. Uh, Typhoon Aoki just about destroyed the island. Um, they rebuilt the bar right away. Um, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, most of the island was uh, pretty well wipe, wiped out, but uh, they, they had their uh, um, priorities straight. Uh, there's numerous bunkers and, and battle remnants remain, and it is truly an island frozen in time. I mean, no matter where you go on the island, you will see remnants of World War II. One of the reasons we went was, if you can see here, we were number 14 worldwide in club log, which meant we're, we were really um, high priority in club log. That's number 14 worldwide. In Europe, I think we were number five, I guess, Dick and, Paul and uh, Joe, four. So we were, we were very uh, wanted in Europe and uh, um, some parts of uh, Asia as well. The, uh, um, western part of Asia. This is Carl Smith's uh, publication, and we came out number 21 there for a while. I think before we left, we were somewhere up here. But uh, it was a fairly, uh, fairly significant uh, place to go. When we got back from um, uh, Swain's Island, Joe Blackwell, where are you, Joe Blackwell? Oh, there, he's over there. Uh, Joe Blackwell, thank you very much, Joe, got me to go to uh, Swain's with him, and uh, that was my first day expedition. I had a ball with... Uh, Joe and a group out there. When we got back, we said, okay, where do we go next? So I started to do a little investigation. And most of the stuff you find on the internet today, guys, are basically, you know, it's wrong, uh, it's dated. You, you, you get there, you do research, and uh, it leads you down a lot of dead ends. Um, let me just, I'm gonna summarize all of this thing here because it'll tell you how we got to the island. Um, I started this investigation uh, about the Forgotten 98. I got very well versed in them um, and what happened to them. So I figured, well, it's, look at this, 1943, 2013, maybe we could go out there as a commemorative de-expedition and, and honor those for Forgotten 98. So I got a hold of everybody and their brother. I wrote tons of letters uh, to different uh, personnel in the Department of Interior, the Insular Affairs, the Air Force, um, you name it, I, I wrote uh, letters to. Most of them came back, we no longer do that, that's not part of our job. 
Um, access is restricted, et cetera, et cetera. On December 22nd, 19, uh, 2012, I got a phone call at home. My wife told me, you got a guy who wants to talk to you about the Forgotten 98. So I picked up the phone and we had about a half hour conversation and he was very well ver uh, versed in what the Forgotten 98 was all about. So at the very, very end of that, he says to me, and this is out of the blue, he says, so you wanna, you wanna get an expedition together to go to Wake Island? So I said to him, I said, well, what do you know about an expedition? He says, well, I'm a ham radio operator. <laughs> and I said, you gotta be kidding. I mean, that's after literally writing 20, 30 letters to people I didn't know anybody, you know, didn't know them at all. So he says, I'll, get, I'll see if I can get you on the island. And it was like, yeah, okay, thank you very much. You know, we appreciate it, we'll talk to you later. Sometime in February, February 13th, I get a letter uh, emailed to me from General Hawk Car Carlisle's uh, chief of staff basically saying our, our trip has been endorsed, that the Air Force has endorsed the fact that uh, we want to go out there. Didn't say approved, it said endorsed. So we had to work our way through the difference between an endorsement and an approval between February 13th and when we finally got out there on the 28th. So I just wanted to summarize that chart rather than going down. It gives you kind of a background of uh, what we had to work through to get there. Uh, there was quite a bit of negotiations that went on between here and there. And quite honestly, the second in command of the US Air Force um, in the Pentagon was the one who had to approve us before we left. It was, it was not a low level. We had to go way up to the top to get it. And finally, we got it. And then we were shut down by the government uh, because of uh, you know, sequestration. Um, this is the rock that's out there. We'll go through a lot of this stuff uh, in further slides. I'll see if I can keep going. Uh, you can see, just I, I have no idea what these numbers mean. <laughs> it's a chart that was developed by somebody else, but this can show you that uh, you know, the last few years there weren't very many activity, but uh, we, uh, we did a, a really good job out there. The primary goal of this de expedition, first and foremost, was to keep the memory of those forgotten 98 people alive. Most people don't know anything about them. They don't know what happened to them. They've never even heard of them. So the reason we were going was for that. The, the second reason I wanted to go is I wanted to have fun. You know, re really. I mean, you're going on a de-expedition, and you're going with 11 other guys. You, you got to have fun. If you don't have fun, why go? Um, we wanted to put a very rare uh, entity on the air. Um, some of the guys set up their own goal of 100,000 CUSOs. I never set a goal as team leader, I said, guys, we're gonna go out, have fun, do what we gotta do, and then we go come back. But they set that up, and uh, you'll see later on, it was quite, a, quite a, an accomplishment. Uh, minimize busted calls, we wanted to make sure if we got you in the log, we got you in the log correctly. We weren't gonna leave you, we're gonna leave you high and dry, we weren't gonna say, okay, you know, a P is a B or something like that, we're gonna make sure you're in the log correctly. And quite honestly, I think the number we had when we got back after the logs were or massage a bit, was a, I think 152 busted calls. Now 152 busted calls on 100,000 is quite an accomplishment. So you can tell the people that we went with. The guys were really, Joe, Dick, I mean, the other guys that went, they were really accomplished, the, ex, the expeditioners. Um, respect the opportunity to, as, uh, to visit and as being guests of the, uh, of the US Air Force, we wanted to make sure we were uh, representing um, uh, amateur radio in the, in the best possible light and create some great memories. I mean, when you go out and you're, you're with 11 other guys for two weeks, uh, you have some memories to remember. To, What's to, on the plaque, though? What is it? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll go into that. Basically, it's, it says uh, the 98 Rock, and I'll tell you the significance of that in a bit. This is what the, um, finally we got the okay to go on the 20th of October, and this is what they said. Approve your request, you're approved to, re to proceed. And I jumped around, cried, it was, yeah. Um, this is when we set up. Uh, this was our schedule. Again, we got the approval there, and we had to hurry up and get to Honolulu. I mean, and that was no insignificant feat either. Guys had to make reservations. We had to get our hotel set up, um, and we, we got everybody there. All 12 guys arrived in plenty of time. And let's keep going from there. And then we had to get out to wake on uh, the, uh, the Air Force transport was, uh, was set up for the uh, first. We got to Honolulu, and we got to Honolulu, and the first night we were there, it was uh, Halloween, and none of us had our Halloween costumes on, except some of the waitresses did. There's one back there, but can't really see what her... But this is the group that went, and uh, Joe Pater is over here. 
Ralph K9ZO and some of the Hawaiian uh, people that met us there. It's kind of our thing now, and Joe Blackwell can tell you this, when we go to, uh, through Hawaii and we go on a day expedition, we normally meet with some of the Hawaiians and go out to dinner. And we uh, were out, I guess, until about, I don't know, 10 o'clock that night, and here we are at 1 o'clock in the next morning trying to get on, on the uh, little bus there to get us to uh, Hickam Air Force Base. And that was a merry group of, uh, of the expeditioners finally, finally getting to go to uh, uh, Wake Island after many months of uh, on and off. This was us checking in. Uh, the Air Force was ready for us. Uh, there was a whole bunch of people there, and they just, you can see Dick over here getting through the line, and uh, Ralph waiting, and uh, Mike, K9NW. This was our boarding pass for the uh, military transport. Uh, you see zeros over here. That's not quite the case. They do bill us. And substantially, I probably paid more to go to, uh, from Hawaii to um, um, Wake than I probably have paid to go to Europe. Um, this was the first time we had our team meeting. You can see uh, yours truly over here. And this is the first time we all got together and we actually had time to sit down and talk. And that's where I, my goal was have fun. That was my number one goal or number two goal after uh, the Forgotten 98. And that's where a lot of the guys started talking about 100,000 CUSOs. And, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, Dick if, uh, and Joe, if you have anything you want to jump in, just, you know, just do. And then it was, we had to hurry up and wait. We just sat in the airport. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I think we got there at 1 o'clock or 1.30, and we had to wait until, like, I could think, 7 o'clock when we boarded the plane or something like that. This was the roll call for it. Um, this was the, the other happy campers. Uh, on the plane. By the way, this plane was, it, it's a uh, leased plane to the Air Force uh, from a company called ATI, and uh, it was the first time it had flown to Wake, and it was a completely reconditioned air, air, um, aircraft. Before this, we thought we would go with a 757 that was many years old, but it, this was just absolutely beautiful plane. Half of it, the front half of the plane is cargo, the back half of it is passengers. And this is our first sighting of Wake. You see this little uh, map down here and the little X's? This will give you an orientation as to which way we're looking. For instance, the X, we're looking down the runway, and you can see us looking down the runway there. Uh, this was our first view as we're landing. There's Peel Island off there, Wilkes Island here, and Wake here. Uh, this was the plane, again, just a spotless plane inside and out, just a, a beautiful flight. We weren't supposed to take pictures of anything on a flight line. I don't know how we got those pictures. <laughs> this picture here I took, but in order to step across this yellow line, now there is nothing on this island. I mean, there is nothing in the air, in the, on the air base, really. There's, there are no planes, no nothing. But in order to go out here past those lines and take a picture of this way, I had to go see the air boss up here. And he was like, you really want to do what? I said, yeah, I'd like to go on the tarmac to take a picture. Oh, we don't do that, you know. I said, well, come on, I just want to take a picture. He said, all right. So we went down and took that picture. But I mean, there is nothing there. There's really no planes coming or going, or very few. Uh, these were our hosts. Uh, this fellow is the site manager. Uh, the Air Force out there, Dick is an Air Force retired colonel. And um, I hate to say it, but the Air Force does very little out there other than manage their contractors. And these are two contractors. Now, you may have recognized this fellow's call, WA2YUN. He's a resident ham out there. He's rarely on the air, but he has a beacon on six meters. So anybody who runs six meters uh, and monitor the, uh, the beacons from around the, the uh, world, he has a beacon that runs almost continuously, and you'll see a lot of uh, spots for uh, Colin. Colin was great. He prepared the whole, um, all of the uh, AC for us, uh, got us all the, the tables and chairs and everything else. He, was quite, he was uh, extremely cooperative for, uh, for our expedition. This was uh, Colonel Charlie Taylor, quite a guy. Um, you'd be proud to have him in your U.S. Air Force. Really, really a, a gentleman and uh, took really good care, care of us and made sure everything was uh, to what we needed. This is downtown Wake. Uh, again, looking at the little map down here, this is that little thumb that sticks over here. This is where everything is, downtown. They call it downtown because there's Nothing anywhere else except for the airstrip. Um, and a little view. You can see a, um, they, we have a medical facility there. We did not have to bring a doctor with us. As Bob Alfin could tell you, normally when we go on these de-expeditions, we bring our own doctor. We did not have to do that on this de-expedition. Uh, there is a resident doctor, and we'll, go, we'll 
show him in a bit. This is where we check in. Uh, this is where our dormitory or our billet, uh, we stayed there. Uh, we had air conditioning. It was just absolutely beautiful, except my room was right here, and that air conditioning blew the first day I was there. But, was, it hot, was it hot as hinges, hail as hinges? No, it wasn't. It, it, was, it was hot in the sun, but it was uh, tempered. It was like 85, 80, 85. So it was really nice. Um, not having an air conditioning was not, but after, you know, he fixed it. They, fi they, they jump right over on it, too. They fix it right away. They're, they're really good. They, they have about 100 contractors there that do just about everything. They do air conditioning, motor pool, uh, laundry, you name it. Uh, and they're from Thailand. They're not American contractors. They're contractors through that Chugash, and uh, they were all from Thailand. They had Filipinos there, and the Filipinos wanted to unionize, and the Air Force sent a C-130 out there and took them all over the island and <laughs> brought in the Thais. Thais haven't tried to unionize. <laughs> this was when we first got there. You can see Dick's happy face. He said, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, Joe was wiping sweat off his head, and I was taking pictures, I guess. Um, this is Hal W8HC and Craig K9CT, and you can see Colin in the background. Um, this was all of our material when it got there. Uh, it got there about two weeks before we did. It was shipped by accident. It should not have been shipped because we didn't have approval until the 28th of October. But for some unknown reason, uh, they elected to ship it. But thankfully, everything got there. And Colin had it all stored for us, so we just had to just go and pick it up. What we did was, uh, using Google Earth and, uh, and also Colin on the ground, we determined that we're going to have two sites, sideband site and a CW site. Uh, the CW site was the, um, uh, right across from the air terminal. Uh, you can see the air terminal here where I went out on the tarmac and took a picture. And here's the chapel, and this is the ocean. And using Google Earth, it's great because you can lay out all of your antennas. You can find out how many feet of wire you need, how many feet of coax, et cetera. This was the abandoned chapel. They have a, the, the chapel is just beautiful. It was just built, and they abandoned it. It's right across from the, uh, from the terminal. Um, the, the reason probably they, um, there's nobody out there for Sunday services. I mean, but this is uh, the setup. Uh, the chapel, here's that Marine Memorial. We'll talk about that. Uh, we used uh, step IRs. We had a big step IR with the 80-meter coil here, and then we had a big IR here. And later on, we also had a... Uh, a Battle Creek special. You can see we're looking down towards downtown, which is back in the distance. Uh, this is one of our operators, Mark and Colin, the Air Force terminal, or the Wake terminal across the way. This is when they set up the uh, Battle Creek special. And I think that, is that your deck? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's you. Pointing, uh, it, it's up. And uh, it, anyone who's ever put up a Battle Creek special knows it's not much fun. It, it goes up, but it's not much fun to put up. Uh, not as much as the Titanix, but it does wobble, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, this is looking at the ocean view, looking out from where the chapel was, looking out towards the ocean. We had beautiful propagation on 160, right out over the ocean. And this is basically what it looked like. We had our laptops, our K3s, the KPAs, the step IR stuff. Uh, Colin had arranged for the tables and chairs. He also arranged to have the AC put back in, not air conditioning, but um, alternating current put back in the chapel. It wasn't there before we got there. Can you go back there? You, sure. Is that last shot out of doors? No, that's, uh, this is all indoor. This, yeah, this is just the background of the slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And this was uh, like a typical operating. This is when they were initially <laughs> testing to set up everything, making sure everything was working. Uh, you can see shoes are optional. Um, Mike is, Mike, this is my K9NW. Mike is a CW machine. He's like Joe Blackwell. He will sit there forever, never pick his head up. He always, his, his leg is always jumping up and down like this, and he's always drinking. You can see a bottle next to him of whatever that was, but he's always either got Gatorade or something, and he just goes on. And that's what it looked like. <laughs> that's what it looked like. I wanted to put him up on the altar, but they said, no, we're not going to do that. So, <laughs> um, but again, shoes were optional. Uh, this is some of the remnants laying outside. This was the, um, you know, an engine from a, a plane. We couldn't tell if it was Japanese or American. There's a prop, I guess. There's an anchor around here somewhere. Um, and again, we had two sites. Let's keep going. The second site is the sideband and the, uh, and the Ritty site. And we rented a shack from the guy who runs the power plant. This is the power plant here. You can see the dirty mark on the roof. That is um, air... Um, Jet, air, air, uh, jet fuel 
from the generators, and it goes up and it stains the top of the, uh, of the roof. It also kind of comes over this way towards us. At, at prevailing winds are this way, so we always had a good whiff of the uh, jet fuel. Um, we rented this from uh, one of the, the guy who uh, runs that, and uh, we used that for uh, the two weeks we were there, and it's a hut. What happened is they have a lot of dormitories and billets and uh, things laying around the island from when the, uh, it was, there was a lot of military there. And what they do is when they want to have a hut, they go, they take pieces of these, of the uh, barracks and they just put it together and make a hut out of it. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, that's from, we walk through the front door of the, uh, of the hut looking out over the lagoon. Um, this was the other uh, big IR with the 80 meter coil. Uh, next to the lagoon, a close-up shot. And what this, this was great because uh, we needed radials for that. And as everybody knows in this room, if you want good propagation, you should have radials in the water. So what I did was I tied a bunch of these radials to the uh, coral that's here and just threw them out into the lagoon. And we had really good propagation with that antenna. And uh, let's keep going. Uh, this was the other one we had. This was the standard one without the 80 meter coil. And this was on the other side. This is another hut. This is on the other side of, an, of the other hut. And again, just a beautiful, just a beautiful view out to the lagoon. It just, it's breathtaking to, to see those colors. And all kinds of fish and sea snakes and you name it are in that lagoon. How deep is it? Uh, yeah, four to five feet. Yeah. yeah, the average depth is four to five feet. You probably could walk across, although when they were prepping the island for uh, World War II. They dug a, a channel over here, uh, and they were going to have a submarine base, and they blasted all the coral out. And it's still pretty, matter of fact, it's right here. Uh, they blast a lot of coral out, and it gets pretty deep there. It's, I think it's about 15 feet deep. Uh, this is the uh, sh looking inside the shack. I think that's me there. I'm not sure. Um, again, we also had an, an eight element, six meter Yagi set up for us. Colin, who's a six meter operator, he's gonna be using that for uh, EME, Earth, Moon, Earth uh, propagation. So he set it up for himself, but he let us use it. Again, just a great guy. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like inside. I don't know what I was doing there. This is Hal W8HC. I don't know if that's you, Dick, over there or not. It could be. Yeah, that's right, you guys were teammates. Oh man, we should have separated you two. Yeah. Woo. Uh, this is looking from uh, where Hal was sitting out over the lagoon. These were the Transworld um, antennas that we brought along. Joe paid a W-H-E-E-X, thinks the world of these. So we figured we'd try them, what the heck? So we set them up and they work pretty darn well. Um, they're just, they set up in about five minutes. We set them up next to the lagoon and uh, they work pretty well. Never heard of them. Yeah, TW antennas are made in Ohio, I think. Crossville, Tennessee. There it is, thank you, Joe. That's close to Ohio, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, why the big IR verticals, and I highlighted the, uh, in red, they're easy to ship. They're 15 pounds, they're easy to assemble, and it's a great de-expedition antenna. Don't have to set up, uh, you know, you're the DX, you don't really need that DB gain. It's nice to have, as Bob did when they went out to Amsterdam. They had beams set up, and it's great for hearing, but uh, uh, we wanted to get in and get out and do it as best we could. So, and also, by the way, let me, let me tell you why 15 pounds is significant. To ship things to Wake Island, the Air Force charged us $11 a pound, okay? Now, if you think about a three-pound sledge, which Dick set up all of our site-specific material, we had uh, three foot lockers of site-specific material, and one day he and I went over to Lowe's and we did a lot of shopping, and if you think of a three-pound sledge that costs $7.99, it costs $33 to ship that damn thing out there, okay? So needless to say, we didn't bring a lot of that stuff back. That stuff stayed there, and we gave it to some of the uh, contractors. But again, uh, weight was definite, a uh, definite consideration, because we don't want to spend your money, because basically your money supported this, the expedition. Uh, the, other re the other thing we did was we took Elecraft. I don't have my Yesu uh, shirt on today. Thank you very much. Uh, but we brought the uh, K3s. The reason for the K3s, again, small footprint, eight pounds, outstanding the expedition uh, transceiver. Just, they work uh, phenomenally. They work, they interface really well with the amplifiers, uh, which are these KPA 500s. All of this stuff was pre-sold. Uh, Elecraft said, hey guys, you want to set them up the way you want them? And uh, my team basically set them up the way they wanted them. We brought them with us. 
And when, on the way back, they bought them all. So every KPA, every K3 was sold by the time we got back stateside. And this is my K9NW uh, running his uh, normal CW. Uh, this was the sideband. Basically, it's the same setup as the CW side without the key. Uh, we used N1MM. Fantastic. It, was, it worked out really, really well. Uh, you can see, I think this was Mark NA6M running. I think he was running at that time 206 in the last 10 and 179 in the last 100. So he's, Mark is a pretty good CW operator. He, you know, he's like Joe. He can just pound, pound away. We've had, we had some great operators with us. Uh, we used these laptops. Laptops worked fantastic. We bought, I think, eight of them. Um, we only had problems with one. And uh, the one we had problems with was one that Dick and I were using. Um, it was infested with uh, ants. Ants like you've never seen before in your life. They crawled, up the, they crawled up the power cord, Dick, right? They crawled up the power cord from the ground and they came up. And I don't know why they wanted just the laptop, but they just wanted the laptop. So Dick says, oh, we got a problem here. <laughs> so he picked, the, that's the way Dick sounds, by the way. And he picks up the laptop and the, la the outline of the laptop was red with ants. I mean, it was just loaded with ants. So it was either Tuesday or Thursday, or I think those are the only two days the store was open, and we picked up some Raid. So we came back and we sprayed the place with Raid. Um, I don't want to say I inadvertently, but I think Dick inadvertently sprayed one of the uh, <laughs> laptops with it, Raid, and needless to say, that laptop didn't last well, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to almost take credit for spraying a laptop, Dick. But this uh, little, you know, we have the toolbar here. It slowly started creeping up and up and up and up until finally one day it, it, it just died. But we had, we had a spare, so we swung over to the spare. And luckily, uh, N1MM software, it, as you do a QSO, it, it just, you know, writes to hard drive. So um, we didn't lose anything, thank goodness. Uh, this was my playbook. Um, Dick came up with a, a schedule for um, operating, which was... It took a lot of um, uh, thought process behind it. And, and I am going to give you credit for it, Dick, because when we were on Swain's, we operated, what was it, Joe? Three on, six off, three on, six off, something like that. Dick came up with this four on, eight off, four on, eight off, three on, six off. So you rotated ships, okay? You wouldn't always be stuck with the same propagation to the same part of the world. And it gave you the eight hours off where you could recoup. Now, four hours sitting down is a lot of hours as well, but that eight hours gave you time to recoup. The six hours on Swain's just didn't work for me anyway. I just could not get enough sleep. It was 102 degrees, that's another story. But. So what I did every day was we had this whiteboard and I would set guys up, like team two was our opening team and they worked a four hour shift. Then when they finished, team two again came on, they worked another four hours, then they went up and they worked another three hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the guys started calling this the playbook and one wise guy said, do not write in this box, and he wrote in the box. He also put a little, you know, uh, end around. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, well, Bob knows what it's like to deal with some of these guys, right, Bob? Uh, these were our operators, uh, Craig, K9CT. He was just with uh, Bob out in uh, Amsterdam. Mike, K9NW, Jim, and 9 tk uh, Mark, NA6M, and Ralph, K9ZO, and jo Joe, Joe. Yours, yours truly back there, busy at work. And these were your uh, CW Ritty guys. I did operate a little bit. I snuck in a, a, a half a shift of CW. Um, this was Joe Pater, Dick in the back. Uh, John K6MM, who by the way put this presentation together. John is absolutely a super guy. He does a tremendous amount of work. He's just a great guy to have part of the team. Here's Jerry WB9Z, another uh, world class de expeditioner with Bob out on. Uh, Amsterdam, just a great guy. Uh, Hal, uh, uh, W8MHC from uh, West Virginia. And again, my, uh, that's me with my mouth open again. Never usually stops. But uh, DX pileups, um, kind of cool when you're back here, you know, you're operating and you're doing sweepstakes and stuff. You only get A's and K's and N's and W's. So you can copy that stuff pretty good. But once you start getting out in the DX side, you got all of this stuff coming at you. <laughs> And it gets a little um, confusing. Um, we had one guy, and 
uh, it was, where was it, Joe, on Swain's? Uh, Juliet Lima won, Lima, Lima, Lima. And he came back, it was Juliet Rima won, Rima, Rima, Rima. And it was like, uh, try that again. But uh, when you're on the other side of the pileup, it's interesting because you never know, especially we were running vertical, so we didn't know where we were gonna get propagation. They were coming at us from every which way. And it was, it was uh, kind of fun to pick them out. Um, once the expedition starts, you have four choices. And you, there are very few other than this. Eat, sleep, operate, and wander around. And uh, didn't get uh, too much of the wandering around, but uh, you gotta have a certain amount of discipline because when your shift is ready to go, you better be there. Except for me when I missed my first shift, sorry Dick. <laughs> Nothing in my room worked. My TV didn't work, my alarm clock didn't work, my air conditioner didn't work, and my first shift I was late and Dick was really upset with me. That's another story. Um, Marine Corps Memorial, you can see the Marine Corps Memorial there. Um, this is a close-up view. This is a dedicated to the Marines that lost their lives, not only on the island, but also uh, in the POW camps. And this was the last word that they got from the commander um, in, on Wake, going back to Pearl, was enemy on island, situation in doubt. And you can see some of the um, memorial uh, needed a little bit of maintenance. This stuff here you really can't uh, touch. But uh, I had read, and it's part of my research before we went to Wake, that one of the things that uh, Marines do when they pass through Wake was they take care of this memorial, that it's their duty, that uh, if the memorial needs any kind of work done to it, that they, they're not supposed to leave the island without taking care of it. So uh, a good friend of mine from uh, Long Island, I got a hold of him, he's a Marine. You know, once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine, and he is a Marine. I asked him if I could do it in his honor. So he says, yeah, sure, you know, just you know, make note of it. And I said, okay, I will. So I brought a can, went over to Dick's house, brought a can of white paint and um, a um, uh, paintbrush, and we put it in the site-specific material, and we shipped it over there. And it was kind of neat because on November the 6th, this guy shows up. He's the three-star general for uh, the entire Marine Corps in the Pacific. Now, we did not know he was coming. We had no idea. He was flying to China, and he was using Wake as the refueling. So Captain Charlie Tell, who is our Air Force uh, um, um, host, told us that he was coming in. So what happened was uh, Colonel Roebling, I'm sorry, General Roebling, came into the, the, F, the uh, terminal, which I showed you before. He was walking across the street in his entourage. He had about seven or eight people with him. They all got in a 15-passenger van and they toured the island. And General Roebling and his adjutant, or I don't know what they call him in the, uh, in, in the Marine Corps, but he, they started walking across the street. So I went over and I met him and I introduced myself and brought him over and I asked him if he would do the honors. And he did. Yeah, he did. That's great. It was kind of cool. That's really great. You know, and it was, it was, he was the kind of guy, he said, you know, hey, yeah, definitely, let me go do it. And we opened up, you can see the can of paint down there, we opened it up, and he just got to it. And then after that, this was his um, uh, sergeant major, that's it, sergeant major, uh, Bill Stables. Uh, he got to it, too, and he started doing it. And I was standing there watching, as I usually do, saying, hey, you, got, you know, get down there and let's, let, let's, let's do a better job than that, you know. But uh, no, they were, they were great guys. And then right after that, they went back and they just hung out with us while their entourage toured the island. These guys just stayed with us and talked to us and wanted to know where we were from and we introduced ourselves. Um, and just really, really nice guys. And it worked out really well. You couldn't have asked for anything better. It just worked out perfectly. Um, and again, that's the Marine Memorial. You can see where the, this was before they painted. And what, a, what a boost for Dan Radio in the Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was great. He, he had, they, they had these little medallions that uh, they give out as mementos, and I have it at home, where you know, it shows that uh, you actually met him, and, you know, and uh, we've had uh, emails going back and forth since then. So, yeah, he, he, he's a good guy. There's also a Japanese war memorial out there, which I was kind of surprised about, but there is one out there, and it's really nice. It's a very uh, well-designed uh, memorial, uh, and it was basically put there by uh, JAL, Japan Airlines, and basically it says the evils of the war, you know, may peace, prevail on the waters of the Pacific forever. I was very surprised there was a Japanese memorial there. Uh, daily life on Wake, and I will explain the rock in a second. Um, 
you eat. <laughs> this was the uh, this was four of the five. There's probably the guy, other one. That, that's all the Air Force that are there. There are five people, total five for the whole island. Uh, this was kind of the food. Most of this was Thai food. <laughs> there was some a little American food down here. Um, this has a little explanation. When we first got there, they, they have these little cups here, you know, the ice cream cones. And um, they had little, little tiny cones about that big. And I'm, I love ice cream. And I wasn't going to settle for little tiny cones. So I go found, found the soup bowls. And uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We're going to shut off then if you're going to. Go ahead. Whenever there was an important decision to be made, who, of course, couldn't be everywhere <laughs> partaking in all the decisions. But whenever a number of us were getting around to figure out, like, you know, where should we put the antennas? Should we change bands? Is it happy hour yet? <laughs> what should we have for dessert? First question that always came up among us was, well, what would Lou do? <laughs> <laughs> and that soon got abbreviated to, WWLD. <laughs> it, it, it did, yeah. So following Lou's, you know, admonition for discipline, that was always the first question. Now we didn't always do what we thought Lou would do. <laughs> he wasn't all that smart. But when it came to ice cream, we all did what Lou did. <laughs> Get the big bowls yep. and fill it up. Not those tiny little cups. No, those, they, they were tiny. They, they, they were was, tiny. It yeah. wasn't even worthwhile. Yeah, no. Right. So, no. If you're going to do something, you've got to do it with gusto. So we followed his leadership some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> also, there were a lot of desserts in this. You can see most of them are missing by the time we got to them. But, um, we also had a official flag. Uh, that takes a little bit of explanation. But when you get 12 guys together and people start tell, st telling stories, some of them get a little bit tall. You know, the tales are a little bit you know, wild. So Joe brought along this official flag. This is Joe paid at W-A-G-E-X. And when one of us would go off on one of our little tangents, the official flag would come out like one of the uh, NFL flags and be thrown. And, yeah, and if he didn't have it with him, he'd pick up a tissue or a napkin or something and throw that. So uh, we also had internet there. It was as slow as molasses. It was like the old 1200 board. You know, you could see the screen being painted line by line. It was terrible. Um, there's a post office there, there's a barber shop there. There's no way I get my hair cut out there, but that's another story. Uh, there is a company store on Tuesdays and Thursdays they were open. You could go in and buy what you needed, you know, laundry detergent. Uh, we were originally told there would be no beer on the island because the uh, Missile Defense Agency was just, they, they left before we got there. And we were told by the time they leave there would be no beer on the island, but that proved to be false and uh, there was quite a bit left for us, uh, which made a lot of people happy. Uh, there's a three-room library, fully stocked. I mean, you want a book, it's in there. There's a little, tremendous amount of stuff there. We also had our own little washers and dryers. Uh, the, the place is um, Peel Island, the one that was shaped like a seal, and the other one, Wilkes Island, is covered with the bird sanctuaries. And there's a lot of different kinds of birds um, and all kinds of creatures. And, they, and they, they're very tame. You walk right up to them, and they don't even, they don't even get up and fly away. Um, we had almost a daily shower, and we had rainbows after that. This one, we had a really bad storm for almost the whole day. It just came down in buckets. And you can see the air conditioners here that did not work, by the way, for the chapel. They were all rusted. Everything on that island is rusted. The salt has gotten to everything. It's encrusted. It's just, ah, oh, terrible. Um, then after the rain, you get the beautiful uh, sunsets. Uh, this is a, a bridge going over to Peel Island. It used to be a, um, uh, a bridge made of wood that goes across, and for some reason it burnt. And uh, so now there is no way to get over to Peel other than in kayaks. They have kayaks that are off this way, and you can take a kayak across. I never did, but it's very shallow. You can almost walk across. There's a lot of flotsam, floatsam, whatever they call it, uh, these things that float uh, from the uh, fishing trawlers. Uh, you walk along the beach, there's going to be one every... 20 yards. Uh, that's kind of what the beach looks like. It's all coral. There's no sand whatsoever. I mean, it's just, you walk along there, your, your ankles go every which way. Is it all full of skeeters? It, uh, no, no. Matter of fact, there were very, there were not like swains. Swains, if you go off into the jungle, there were a lot of mosquitoes. This one here, there were very few bugs, other than uh, Dick's pets of the, uh, you know, those little ants, <laughs> you know, the ones he made pets of. 
Um, this was that power generator plant I was talking about. You can see the, uh, you know, the dark part of the roof. You can also see some of the smoke. Now we were, if you take the, um, the sideband shack, we faced that and the wind was prevailing coming this way. So we always had a nice scent of um, airplane uh, fuel in our... Uh, this was Colin. He's the, um, he's the guy who's out there, WA2YUN. This is uh, Scott Kennedy. He's a resident doctor, or re I shouldn't say resident. He's an interim doctor. He comes and goes. Um, he, the doctor position comes and goes. He'll, he'll be out there for about three months and then he'll rotate through and somebody else come on. Uh, when we left, this guy actually cried because he said, no, I have nobody to talk to. He was, he's quite a character. He's from uh, out west somewhere. Uh, these are some of the, um, uh, the remnants of the, uh, of the bunkers. Uh, we used to have to walk, Dick and I walk past this every day on our way to the sideband shack. This was the Admiralty Command Post. I went inside and it's basically a crumbling uh, bunker. It was just uh, threaded rod and uh, reinforcing rod all, all coming off the ceiling. It's uh, fairly dangerous to walk in there, but I wanted to see what it looks like. You can see a lot of it is just crumbling. Uh, this one is fairly well kept. This one overlooked the uh, entrance to um, that bridge where the uh, peel comes across. This is another bunker. No matter where you go on the island, you're gonna see bunkers from either the Japanese or the Americans. This was, an, I think that this was an ammunition bunker, which was right by the uh, Marine Memorial. Uh, this is the old uh, radial teletype communication center. Um, you can see open wire lines going this way and coming this way. And they were going out to the rhombics uh, that were off in the field. Uh, it's, it's just total disaster right now. One of the guys almost fell through the floor over here um, because the floor is dilapidated. But I think this was Collins equipment, if I'm not mistaken, Dick, right? Something like that. And it's just, you know, they just, they just took us there. And, they, and to get into that place, you have to go through vines and a whole bunch of stuff. It's just in bad shape. Um, this is a revetment. This is where they, um, the Japanese parked their, um, their planes. This is another wall here you can barely see because it's end on. Uh, the Japanese would park their planes here. It was built by the POWs. So if they were strafed, they, um, they wouldn't get to the planes. That didn't work too well because we bombed the hell out of them, cut them straight down instead of the other way. <laughs> Um, this is the original Wake Airfield Terminal, not like the one I showed you before. And right there is the site of the Truman MacArthur meeting um, in uh, 1950. It was right shortly after that when Truman fired uh, MacArthur because they couldn't get along. They didn't like each other. Um, this is a Japanese uh, ship out here that's sunken. Uh, that Suva Maru was sunk uh, during 1943 when uh, the um, Yorktown was coming past with its uh, carrier group. They sunk it. The Japanese tried to run away. They came up here and they ran aground and, and it sunk there. I don't even think uh, we bombed it. That's a picture of it uh, from the uh, archives. Uh, the west side, again, looking out from here, looking out over the ocean, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, some of these waves out here that are past the reef, they've got to be 10 to 15 feet. They are really huge waves. I used to surf. I would not go out on those, no way. This is the prison of the war rock. Um, and again, this is over on Wilkes. Uh, this is where the sideband shack was. This is where the CW shack was. Uh, this is where the 98 names are inscribed in a uh, granite memorial. Uh, this is the group standing around that uh, same granite memorial. And uh, this is the POW rock. The inscription on the POW rock says 98 US POWs 51043, and you can see Joe and I standing there, or actually I'm sitting there, but uh, nobody really knows if this is May 10th, 1943, or 510, 1943, meaning uh, 5 October, 1943. If it was 5 October, 1943, it would be two days prior to the massacre, okay? Um, if it was May 10th, 1943, it was months before. But according to some of the Japanese that survived the, uh, uh, the retaking of the island, there was one American POW that uh, escaped. Now, they, they couldn't tell what, they didn't ever tell whether it was uh, just before the massacre or five months before the massacre. But once they got the POW, they took them back and they beheaded them. So um, the Japanese were ruthless out there. Whatever, whatever they wanted to do, they did. So by the way, that POW inscribed that rock Whoever he was um, sat out there 
and chiseled that. And I can't believe he chiseled because downtown is right over here, and the Japanese had uh, uh, their, uh, in some of their bunkers along here. So, I mean, you talk about bravery, sitting out there, you know, chiseling out a rock when you know uh, the Japanese are right around the corner. And that's kind of look at the rock. And basically what it says here is uh, uh, the POW from the, you know, 1943. That, uh, that one. These are some of the pictures of the, uh, of the 98. Uh, we don't have pictures of all of them because uh, back then they weren't required to, to uh, have their uh, photographs taken because they were civilian contractors. They weren't military. So a lot of them uh, are unknown. The, the pictures are unknown, but we know, the, we know their names. During our expedition, because of the notoriety around it, some of the um, families of the, um, of the uh, 98 um, under, underwent uh, DNA testing because some of the remains are, being, uh, are still being found and they want to see if they can identify as many as they can. Last I heard, three families came forth for uh, DNA testing and hopefully they will get some match and then they can finally uh, identify who all of these folk were. Uh, this is the Massacre Beach, um, beach used in a very uh, uh, wide term because it really is not a beach, it's just a, a bunch of coral. But what we did was we brought back a shoebox full of uh, sand and a lot of the, um, not a lot, about five of the families asked for uh, some of the sand. So we uh, sent them the sand for, as a uh, memorial. Uh, again, this is looking from the uh, POW rock back across. You can see the power plant, our shack was over there. Uh, again, this was cool too because on November 11th, which, which was Memorial Day, we got to celebrate uh, Veterans, I'm sorry, Veterans Day on Wake Island. Uh, during that same day, I had set up a sked with someone back, this fellow here, uh, Don Clower, back in, um, in Boise, Idaho, where most of these 98, most of these 98 were, uh, were um, employed out of. And we set up a sked with him so we could read the 98 uh, names over the air. Um, it was taped by a, a local um, a news outlet and they ran it in their uh, local TV station. Um, there was a eulogy written by uh, the lady who um, um, wrote a book, it's called uh, Building for War, Bonnie Gilbert. And she wrote the eulogy, which I've read over the air. And uh, Don Clower uh, was there and he had uh, reporters in the, in the shack with him. While we were there, uh, Joe Peta, who's never at a loss for words, uh, got to know this fellow who was a um, Coast Guard uh, radio man on this, uh, on this uh, uh, C-130 that came in. It says 131, I think it's a C-130. Um, and they were looking for a ghost ship, a good ship that, or a, a yacht that was out there that no, nobody was on. They couldn't raise them. So they were basically locating that for, uh, for uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the Coast Guard to come out and take a look at the ship. Joe got to know this guy. All of a sudden, we got a tour of the... Uh, of the C-130 inside and out. It was kind of neat because he was a radio operator and he could relate to what we were talking about. Uh, last day was uh, November. Hey, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Uh, that rescue aircraft stayed, I guess, one night. And the next day, we see that shack down close to the airstream. We watched it take off. And when he got 50 or 100 feet above the ground, he did this thing. Yeah, I think it was because at the, when we were there, Joe, we were, we were getting our team picture taken, remember? And we were all on the flight line. And when he took off, he dipped his wings to us. It was kind of cool. Uh, again, break, uh, breakdown pack, not the most fun part of the de-expedition, but it's got to be done. When we broke down, uh, we were looking at Club Lock. John, uh, uh, K6MM went back and, and noticed that, uh, okay, we've worked that many, but look, we're at 99,865. And again, they wanted to do 100,000 no matter what. So I, I said, guys, we got to, you know, break everything down, got to get it over to get it packed, because the Air Force got, has to get all the stuff out of here. So as we were packing, um, they found out we needed 135 more. So what they did was they broke out a 706, which we had with us, and they did manual logging. And they finally got to 100,000 by doing it manually. <laughs> they were going to get to 100,000 no matter what. Actually, this is 100,100 and something. We, after we went back, we found some we didn't, we didn't put into a club log. 
These are some of the breakdowns of uh, what we did. It's, again, this is a little bit higher. 2100 on 160, which was, we're very, very happy with that. Um, we also did quite a bit of RIDI. You can see we did uh, 7,500. Six meters, predominantly JA, Japan, China, um, some Philippines, most of that neck of the woods. Um, also um, Hawaii, and one South American. Okay, let me see if I can skip through this stuff. Breakdown by continent, we, did, we had as a um, goal to try and get Europeans in the log, because it's the, one of the hardest places for Europeans to work. I'm very proud of the fact that the guys concentrated on Europe. We did almost 27% of our contacts with Europe, which is, was phenomenal. Uh, breakdown by mode, by band, you know, we can break it down any which way. We, took, we worked 186, 187 total um, uh, countries, and that's all the breakdowns. Again, the continent. This surprised me, though. Uh, South America, we only had uh, 1,800 approximately on set from South America. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, if you look on YouTube, you'll see there is a South American who was working me personally. And I got on and I said to him, I said, oh, you got a great signal. Where are the rest of the South Americans? You know, we want to work more South America. But we never really heard many of them. That's, and I have no idea why. Uh, we can skip through most of that. Drifter's Reef, this is the bar they rebuilt after the hurricane. They wanted to make sure that thing got rebuilt. Um, it's the only bar on the island, and it is an institution. Uh, when you walk in, uh, well, we'll go through this. Uh, Mr. X, he's a Thai guy. He does everything on the island. Uh, nobody could pronounce his name. So Hal W-H, uh, W-8-H-C said, uh, what's your name? And he said, it's X, X, X. So he says, okay, you're Mr. X. So that became Mr. X for the duration. Um, this was the, um, the uh, doctor who, again, that night he had a couple of beers, and when he walked away, he started crying because we were leaving. Um, then you can see a couple of us hanging out at the bar. This was the last night. And if you walk in the bar and you have your hat on, your hat gets immediately taken off and put up on the, uh, on the rafters. And we, none of us did, so we signed a, a dollar bill and put it up on the rafters. Uh, this is one of the rec rooms, okay? This is one of the rec rooms that they have there, and every unit that comes through takes, a bill, uh, takes one of these tiles down and does some uh, artwork on it. And it really, really is terrific artwork. I mean, if you ever, ever get a chance to see it, it's really good. But if you notice, there's a uh, 50 caliber here that was used by the defenders of Wake, and uh, it's hanging up on the wall. And what we did was, um, you know, we had our K9W. We left that here underneath the 50 caliber. But uh, before I left, I, I got a, a World War II vintage flag, 48 star flag, um, and I brought it in this little display case, and I presented it to the Air Force, and they mounted it above the, uh, above the, uh, the caliber. And then we just shrink wrap and get ready to go. Meanwhile, while we were shrink wrapping, we had guys trying to get that 100,000 uh, contacts. And here's our, um, uh, everybody having their last meal using the NCDXF shirts. This was on the flight line, Joe, just as you were saying, Joe, when we were getting these pictures taken, we all turned around and that other plane took off over here and did one of these. And it was, right, was kind of cool. It's kind of cool. He, uh, he, you know, that's the, um, a uh, way of uh, saying goodbye or saying hello or saluting. And this was when we checked in. This was uh, uh, Corey. He was one of the Chugash, one of the uh, contractors that work in there. Uh, <laughs> you can tell we were all happy to be leaving. <laughs> and let's see. This was the plane. Again, you've seen the plane before. This was all of us coming back. Looks like Dick was having fun. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Dick. <laughs> Did that plane stay there the whole time you guys were there? No, it flew, uh, it, yeah, it, flows, it flies back and forth or it goes to uh, uh, Kwajalein or the, uh, the Philippines or wherever. They, they fly quite a, quite, a bit, quite a bit around there. This is the support team. And I got to tell you guys, there's no way any of this stuff could happen without a support team. And uh, Joe Blackwell's XYL is here. Margaret, she's handling, the, she handled the fundraising. These guys were terrific. They were the, that was the pilot station and also the logistics. Just some of our uh, foundations. Here's your CDXA right here. Yay, CDXA. And um, Indexa right there. And the Calvin Award is over here, I believe, right there. Thank you very much for the Calvin Award. I mean, and you can see the list of uh, contributors. I mean, and also our equipment sponsors. These people were great. 
uh, I was telling one of, the, uh, one of the fellows inside that uh, we needed some power supplies and stuff, and I picked up the phone and I called a guy down in Huntsville, Gigapart specifically, and I said, you know, I need a couple power supplies, you know, can you make me a good deal? He says, no, just tell me what you need. And I told him what I need. Next thing I know, we get all the power supplies, we get all the foot switches, uh, we get, you know, Tentec, they kicked in the, the uh, headphones. I mean, the, you know, we, we have got some really good suppliers here in the U.S., and uh, they take good care of us, and we got to take good care of them. All right? Um, uh, this, was our, this is our QSL card. I hope everyone's getting theirs, and Joe, if you don't, Joe's right in the back there. Um, and again, Wake Atoll, this is a, a beautiful picture of the stepper. Uh, this is the first place where America begins on the other side of the date line. Uh, the Forgotten 98 will always be remembered. Okay. Alan and I were walking back one night, and uh, we both had our cameras with us, and we stopped and we saw that and said, we learned from previous de expeditions. This is our KUEE picture, our Bob Alton picture. Because okay, cool. he's always got these in his. So we said, here's our. And we both took about 20 of them. I don't know whether he took this one or I took He took that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> Dick took all the bird pictures, by the way. Dick's a bird man. He likes to take all the bird pictures. Again, thanks, everybody, for chipping in to get us out there. I mean, we all chipped in uh, personally, but there's no way, as Bob can tell you when he does his talk, there's no way we can get to these islands, transport all of our gear, and get you in the log in as many band slots as possible without your support. It's just unbelievable how much it takes to get there. All right? Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Pretty amazing. Now, stay tuned for part two as we head over to the Amsterdam Island uh, de-expedition from just a couple of weeks ago. And if you enjoyed this and want to help out our ability to put things on the air, th those guys did all the work in terms of the de-expedition and stuff. They spent weeks there <laughs> and spent a lot of money. But I did put in a couple of good solid days of, uh, of work editing and uh, shooting and, and getting stuff online. So I've done my part looking for your contribution through Arvin at hamradionow.tv. So please stop by if you enjoyed the program and help us out over there. In the meantime, that's it for part one. Be back with part two as soon as you click the button. Over and out. Yeah.